Hello, I am making a WebGL application and I needed to render some text. If you're watching this, you probably have a good idea of what to do, but I'll go into the specifics. Most notably, I'll demonstrate how we use instancing to make our text render fast. If you're completely unfamiliar with OpenGL and WebGL, you won't be able to follow and should learn some of the basic concepts and terminology elsewhere. If you're aware that a vertex is a point on a polygon and that computers rasterize triangles from the aforementioned vertices, get cozy. So here's a quad that we use to represent each letter. Four single precision vertices. Single precision means we use 32 bits to represent each floating point number, while double precision means utilizing 64 bits uh, per float instead. Each vertex is represented by two single precision floating point numbers. Yes, my application is 3D, but we only use two dimensions to represent this quad. I'll show you what this data looks like in memory soon. We need another quad for every letter. So, um, yeah, we're using a monospace font that every quad will be the same size and look fine. For a non-monospace font, you'd need to size the quads correctly for each letter using more vertex data. These four vertices are stored statically in a vertex buffer, which is sent to the graphics processing unit, or GPU, when the application starts. Let's get an overview. Here are my vertex buffer, or rather, one vertex buffer and an index buffer. Each of them needs to be bound before drawing. What does binding mean? Well, the shader, the program that runs on the GPU, wants some buffers to eat. One for each so-called attribute. These are the attributes. Um, yeah, before sending a draw call to the GPU, we bind another vertex buffer for each of these so-called attributes, and the shader iterates through them with each invocation. The shader iterates through the vertex buffers. The terminology is confusing, but the vertex buffers are just arrays, and we're looping through them. For this quad, the vertex shader runs four times, reading two new 32-bit floats out of the buffer each time and operating on it. You can see that here by the two... Uh, by the two component vector that we're reading in the shader. This means that it's grabbing two single precision floats from the vertex buffer with every iteration. Shaders are highly parallel, meaning our four invocations for the quad would all run at the same time, because it's likely that a different physical core on the GPU will run the shader code on any given vertex. We can draw these positions directly, but I've used an index buffer. I've used triangle strips to render this such that an index buffer doesn't help me at all, but that's out of scope. Imagine a cube, like in the top left over here. Look how many triangles include that same yellow vertex. Instead of repeating the 64, blitz, uh, the 64 bits of floating point data, we can index it with a small 16-bit integer instead, thus saving a lot of memory. That's the point of an index buffer. Anyways. We only have one quad defined in our vertex buffer. We could use a draw call for each letter, shifting the position of the quad for each letter with a transformation matrix. I won't cover those. It works, but it's excruciatingly inefficient. Each draw call is another message we need to send to the GPU, and this way we are doing potentially thousands of them. Using instancing, we can reduce this to a single draw call. In order for this to work, we need WebGL2, which is based on OpenGL3 and is supported by all major browsers since around 2017 and hardware much, much older than that. An instance draw call will draw X values from a vertex buffer an arbitrary amount of times instead of a single time. We can draw these four vertices again and again and again, one for each letter using a single draw call. That's not helpful though, because we'd be drawing it in the same spot every time. However, what an instance draw bestows upon us is a global variable in the shader that increments by one for every instance we've drawn, allowing us to reap the rewards using the power of math. Although that's fantastic and elegant, we'll ignore that and use the one other technique that WebGL instancing allows as of WebGL2. We can designate some or all vertex buffers to iterate after each instance drawn, so we get a new set of position and texture offsets for each letter, instead of drawing the same offsets over and over. Well, let's ignore texture coordinates for a moment and look at the code. Here on the right is the instance draw function. We process four vertex, indi uh, we process four vertex indices as a triangle strip. 
where each index is a 16-bit unsigned short. We start reading from index 0 in the index buffer, and this over here is our uh, magic number that determines how many instances to draw with this single call. Here is the length of the string, one instance for each letter. Here, um, on the left, we're creating two special instanced buffers. Uh, here we store the texture coordinates that determine which letter we display, and here is the special position offset buffer where we store two floats, a horizontal offset and a vertical offset for line breaks. Uh, like other vertex buffers, this data is uploaded to the GPU memory once when we create the text element. But this function creates text elements. Mm, it is then bound before every draw call so that when we draw, the shader knows what data to consume, like I mentioned earlier. And with these function calls, we set these particular buffers to be instanced so that for each letter we get the next position and texture offset. This is unlike our original vertex and index buffers. Um, yeah, this is unlike our original vertex and index buffers from which each instance gets the same vertex data for every letter. This is controlled by some simple math which you can read in the source code in the video description. Now for a word on texture sampling. Uh, now for a word on texture sampling. Each vertex of each letter needs a texture coordinate to bestow upon it the appearance of a letter. An X and Y offset into this texture is calculated from the ASCII character codes of the string we want to represent and applied to each vertex in the shader, the different set of texture or UV coordinates for each instance. Let's look at the end result. Here it is at the bottom, some of the text uh, rendered out from that font. It is sublime. We've made it to the end of the video, just about. Um, here's a diagram, hopefully showing how the instancing behavior functions on these instanced buffers versus these non-instanced buffers. And um, hopefully you saw how that all works in the code. Yeah, as I said, we've made it to the end of the video, and now I'll clarify some of the technicalities um, that you don't need to listen to unless you have unquelled qualms. So, I utilize a basic pixelated monospace bitmap font that was made by an associate of mine while bathing. For something fancier, you could render a vector font into a sign distance field, or SDF, which I will not cover here, but definitely check it out. It's not that hard. If you want proper Unicode rendering, then you have my condolences. Why do we use an instance? Uh, why do we use instance rendering instead of just building a mesh? Since we're generating vertex buffers, anyways. Firstly, <clears throat> I wanted to learn instance rendering. Secondly, I'm pretty sure I have. Uh, I'm pretty sure I save memory because I get to draw the quads with triangle strips this way, thus having four indices per quad instead of six. I can't render the uh, I can't render entire lines of text as strips because that wouldn't allow me to sample the texture correctly. Lastly, I am bad at JavaScript, so although the code works fine, I can't guarantee that it's idiomatic. Feel free to ask anything in the comments. Thanks for stopping by, everyone. Have a splendid day.